Well, thank you, President. Uh, it is indeed a humbling experience for me to occupy this position at this time. I really don't know which is worse, uh, sitting here listening to the introduction or being on the sideline of a real key football game during the playing of the national anthem because all too soon the moment of truth does finally arrive when you either have to stand up, <laughs> say what you have to say, or the game begins, and the pressures that are there with uh, both occasions. The other evening, while I was preparing some thoughts for today, my wife noticed uh, that I was doing something. She asked me what I was doing. I told her that I, of course, had this opportunity and that I wanted to have it something real special because I don't know of a football coach that's been invited to be a devotional speaker. And as a result, I wanted to make sure that it was something very special. And she said, well, honey, just look at it this way. Uh, they wanted something real special that I never asked you. So that took the pressure off a little bit that evening. And then <laughs> it began just a few minutes ago. <laughs> it began all morning, to be honest with you. But I remember as a young man, I used to think about a lot of things, as I'm sure that many of you here do. One of the things that I would think about at times would be the statement that, was, that would be made by people about, isn't so-and-so a spiritual person? Doesn't spirituality radiate from so-and-so? And I used to visualize in my own mind what a spiritual person should be like and I think at that time I thought about a person that walked around with a triple combination in his pocket, had a ready reference for any question that was posed to him, that had a halo around, pretty much falling wherever he went. And it wasn't really until I thought about it some more and, of course, through maturity and other experiences, that I came to realize that a spiritual person can indeed reside in each one of us without changing our basic personality. The Lord made us different for His purposes. And so it's with that in mind that I'd like to direct a few remarks today about what we can do within the framework of our own personality to become a spiritual person. I believe, first of all, before we can become a spiritual person or before we can become anything, we must develop the ability to control ourselves. One of the great blessings given to man and given to each one of us as we were placed on this earth was, of course, our free agency. And with that free agency, the opportunity to make choices, to choose between two alternatives, or in some cases more than two alternatives, but nevertheless, the opportunity of choice. And to think about this agency and about this great blessing, one comes to realize that really the only way that we can ever lose our agency is when we demonstrate the inability to control ourselves. Think about that for a minute. No one can take our agency from us. However, agency can be taken from us when we demonstrate our inability to have self-discipline are the ability to control ourselves. I was impressed with the statement that Brother Robert Hells made when he was called to, as a general authority. 
and in his telephone conversations with President Kimball, when he could answer yes to each of the questions posed to him, and then when he went on to make the remark or make the statement, how grateful he was that he had the agency, that he was free to say yes and to accept such an important calling. Because we are only free when we have our agency and when we have and when we are in the process of controlling ourselves. President McKay has made the statement, what a man continually thinks about determines his actions in time of opportunity and stress. A man's reactions to his appetites and impulses when they are aroused gives the measure of that man's character. Isn't this true? When we are aroused, how do we act or do we react? It's true that at this time we find the measure of a man's character. Being involved in the profession of coaching, it's a very highly competitive and emotional business. Without self-control, and early in my coaching career, there were times when I didn't exercise great self-control, whether it be on the sidelines, whether it be in my relationships with those that were under my charge. At that time, I can think back on a few games that were lost, on a few players that quit the teams as a result of this. And as I think back on it now, I have sorrow for passing the opportunity or missing the opportunity of creating a positive experience in the lives of some of these young people that I had that opportunity. So early in my career, I came to grips with myself that if I were going to stay in this business and that if I were going to be a success in this business, that I would need to develop the capacity or the ability to control myself, myself in all situations and to try and be a positive influence in the lives of those that I had the opportunity of working with. The Lord has indeed blessed me and my wife and my family in the opportunities that have been us been given to us in our chosen profession. So self-control has practical application as well as spiritual application in our lives. I'd like to illustrate this by telling a little of experience about one of the football players we had on our football team this past season and has been with us the last four seasons, probably one of the more remarkable young men that I've had the opportunity of knowing and working with. And I can assure you that over the years there have been many that I've had the opportunity of working and associating with. This young man is Oren Olson, and I'm sure that many of you have heard of Oren, of his background. He's a brother of two brothers that were All-American at Utah State University. One, Merlin, both Merlin and Phil have gone on to play professional football, but one in particular, Merlin, will probably be regarded as one of the one or two best defensive lineman to ever play the game of football in both college and on the professional level. As Oren graduated from high school, he had the opportunity of attending any university in the nation. He had both the athletic background 
and the academic background to make that choice. Fortunately for us, Oren elected to enroll at BYU. First two years, Oren played very well as an offensive center or as a defensive end, starting for us as a sophomore, making honorable mention all conference honors. At the conclusion of spring practice in his sophomore year, I talked with Oren about the possibility of moving to offensive center position, where he could better help the team and that if he had a desire to go on and play professional football, he would probably have a better opportunity at that position than he would as a defensive end. Because he was only, and I use <laughs> the word only uh, facetiously, he was only about 6'2", about 240. wasn't quite big enough for a defensive end in the pro ranks. But Lauren, typical of his character, said, yes, I'd be happy to do whatever is best for the team. I said, well, Lauren, it takes a great deal of experience and practice to learn to snap the ball at a distance of 13 yards that we need to have done on punting situations. We like to have the ball snapped at that distance in seven-tenths of a second, and then having the, the punter take 1.3-tenths of a second and get the ball kicked and have a hang time in the air of four seconds, which gives us a total kicking time of six seconds. And we work on this with stopwatch uh, almost every night in practice. Now, a six-second kick, obviously, a four seconds to get the kick off and two in the air is not what you want, so you'll get it blocked. So it's important that we have someone that can deep snap the ball in that period of time. In all the years that I've coached, I've never had one that could consistently snap the ball at that distance. And so I told Lauren, I said, we have others that can snap the ball. We will take you out of the game on fourth, on fourth down on punting situations. He said, Coach, I'd like to take a football home this summer and work on it. And I said, fine. Well, not only took a football home, but he took his shoulder pads, his helmet, his game jersey. In the heat of the summer, when it was 95 to 100 degrees, he would be out practicing centering the ball. Well, needless to say, when he came back in the fall, he not only was our deep snapper, but he was the only man or player in 25 years of coaching that I've seen that has that ability to deep snap at seven-tenths of a second. Not only this, Oren sung with the Tabernacle Choir for two years while he was in college. He's a 3.6, 3.7 student in the College of Business Management, where he graduated or will graduate this, this summer. I just graduated, excuse me, this past spring. And then typical of Orrin, and which no one knew about, but my wife and I had the opportunity of participating with him when he was married to Sandy Robison, who was the daughter of Clarence Robison, our track coach. And as they were sealed together in the temple for time and eternity, and as they reached over the altar and kissed each other at that time, it's the first time that they had ever kissed each other. They had made that decision early in their courting days. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that's the way to go, but I tell you, it's a, it's a heck of a record anyway. But uh, the point I'm making is that we can discipline ourselves to whatever degree that's important to us, and it is extremely important to each one of us. Item right, number two, I think, is to have a clearly set of defined goals. One of the things that I believe that I found or noticed probably more than any since I have been in coaching, those that do not succeed whether it be in the field of athletics, whether it be in the classroom, or whether it be in life. I believe are those people that fail to realize what the real potential they have. I know this is true with a lot of athletes, but they don't fully realize what they can become and what they can do, and therefore they do not establish goals for themselves, or at least high enough goals for themselves. 
to where they can obtain just about what they would like to. I remember upon my uh, a few years ago when I was coaching at uh, Granite High School, there was a great track coach, one of the great ones in America at that time, who had been the Olympics team coach, retired. This was back in the 50s, early 50s. And upon his retirement, they asked him to list each one of the track events and what he thought would be the ultimate record in each one of those events. At that time, he said that possibly someday someone somewhere may be able to high jump seven feet. But he wasn't sure. There was a young man, Dwight Stones, over the weekend that high jumped seven foot seven inches for a new world record. There was a 17 year old high school lad here, state of Utah in Cedar City, that high jumped over seven feet, first high school player or athlete in Utah. I don't know how many hundred people there are in the country today that can high jump over seven feet, let alone the world. He also said that someday someone would be able to long jump, maybe 26 to 27 feet. A young man a few years ago in the Olympics in Mexico City long jumped 29 feet, two or three inches. And so it has been in each one of those events that were listed at that time about what man can obtain. And each one of them have been surpassed by a wide margin, which only goes to show that we can become just about what we want to become if we can have a clearly defined set of goals and a clear image in our own mind of what we can become. Now, whether it be to establish goals for yourself to read X number of scriptures a week, a day, a month, a year, whether it may be goals that you have established for yourself in your school, in your dating, in all facets of your life. I know that we have established goals in our football career. My wife and I have established career goals, one of being which to be rehired every year. Uh, someone has once said there are two kinds of football coaches in America, those that have been fired and those that are going to get fired. So I hope that doesn't happen for a while, President. Uh, after that introduction, I was all ready to hand him a new contract to see if he'd sign it. But, uh, but it is important that we do establish and have goals in every facet of our life. The third part is to develop the capacity to serve others. I think there are probably a lot of great ways that we can become of service. I remember last fall, after getting off to one of our typically great starts, we lost our first three ball games. And on the third ball game, from coming home from Arizona State, we lost a particularly tough game. We flew back, and as we were flying over the airport, looked down, and there must have been two or three hundred people there. And I thought this was unbelievable. Only at BYU could you go out and lose three games and have that kind of support from the students and from people. And it really touched me to a point where I was sitting by one of the coaches, and I said, isn't that something? I said, here we are, we've lost three games, and all these people are here to meet us at the airport. I reached my wallet and took out a $20 bill, and I said, I'm going to drop it out the window and make someone happy down there. He said, well, why don't you throw two $10 bills and make two people happy? And I thought, that was a good idea. Finally, someone said, well, why don't you take four or $5 bills and make four people happy? That was good. Someone suggested, why don't you throw out 21s and make 20 people happy? And about that time, our trainer, Rod Kimball, a very wise man, woke up and he said, why don't you jump out and make everybody happy? So <laughs> I imagine there are ways that we can uh, be of service. Uh, I'm not prepared to jump out of a plane yet, but uh, I'll tell you, two years over at Colorado State, I'd like to have jumped out of that stadium after we wound up in that great tie, but we'll have to get back at them this fall. They're coming to Provo. I tell our football players there are four kind of players. Those that make things happen, 
those that watch things happen and those that wonder what happened and then those that don't realize that anything ever happened. So we need to be people that make things happen. And the way that we can make things happen is to be of service to people. You hear around the world, you read in magazine articles and newspapers about the word peace and how important peace is to everyone, whether it be individually, whether it be in a country, or where it may be. Peace comes from within. As priesthood bearers and as members of the Church, when we do acts of service for other people, we have this peaceful feeling within us. If that be the case, then indeed peace does come from service, and service is that important to us. I remember reading a few months ago in the church section a, an article by Bishop Brown in which he mentioned four goals that every member of the church should have. He listed number one as conversion to the gospel, number two as service in the family, number three as service in the church, and four as service in the community. Three out of the four goals that he mentioned for every member of the church were goals of service to other people. An old man going a lone highway came upon the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast, deep, and wide through which was flowing a swollen tide. The old man crossed in the twilight dim. That swollen stream held no fears for him. But he paused when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you are wasting strength with building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again must pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build your bridge at even tide? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend in the path I have come, he said. There followeth after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This swollen stream, which was not to me, to that fair-haired youth may a pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building the bridge for him. Wouldn't it be good if we all had the attitude of this man as he was building this bridge. The fourth is to be receptive to the Holy Ghost. I remember a few years ago we had the opportunity of recruiting a young man to our campus who was a non-member of the Church. And he played very well for us on the freshman team at that time. Freshmen were not eligible to play and played very well during the fall. During the spring of the year, and in football, college football at any rate, spring practice is probably the most important time in the life of a college football player. For all intents and purposes, it is during the spring that they determine the level in which they will start the fall and whether they'll be on the first, second, third team, or whatever. Well, this young man started spring practice as a third-unit defensive halfback. By the time we concluded spring practice, and at that time we were playing a team composed of alumni. Well, by the time we concluded spring practice, he was starting for us in the varsity, and he started in the ball game. Well, the game was close, and with about a minute and a half left in the game, we were to as a varsity, were ahead by two points. And the quarterback on the alumni was Virgil Carter, who had been a great quarterback for us and is now still playing professional football. And he had a couple of good wide receivers, and they 
started moving the ball downfield, had the ball inside the 10-yard line with about 30 seconds left in the game. And being an alumni game, of course, not being a great deal of pressure on them, they elected not to go for a field goal but to go for broke and throw a touchdown. Well, this young man stepped in and intercepted the pass, returned it out to about the 30-yard line. We ran a play in the line, run the clock out, and won the ball game. Of course, after the game, everyone was happy and delighted running off the field. I think the fact that we won the game was made them happy, but probably more important, spring practice was over, but nevertheless, they were all happy. This young man walked by and he said, Coach, he said, I'm the happiest man in the world tonight. And I said, well, Paul, I said, you have every reason in the world to be happy. I said, yeah, here you are, a freshman. You've had a great spring. You're well on your way to having a great career for us here at BYU. And he said something at that time that I'll never forget. He said, Coach, he said, I'm really happy about that. He said, but the thing that really makes me happy is that tomorrow my mother and my sister are coming up from California to watch me to be baptized into the church. I thought about that a lot. Here at the height of an athletic performance and excitement of a young man, the most important thing in his life was the fact that he was going to be baptized. And I, like I'm sure many of you, can think about your own baptism. And I was baptized at eight years of age, like I'm sure many of you. And I don't think at that time that I fully appreciated that which was happening to me and the great gift that was given to us as the Holy Ghost. Because we know from the scriptures and from what we've been taught and read that we cannot know for a surety the truthfulness of the gospel the mission of Jesus Christ, or that which we have without the Holy Ghost. Now, with the Holy Ghost being a living a part of us, it must be fed, it must be nurtured, it must be taken care of, and we can only do this through prayer, through study, through adhering to the voice of the prophet, to our bishop, to our branch president, to our quorum leaders, and to all those that have an interest and in our welfare at heart. Now, may I again express to you what a real pleasure this has been for our, my wife and for me. And I would like to bear my testimony to you that the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it is a part of my life, which it is, I can't think of anything that I do that isn't revolved around that which I believe. It's a part of me. And that along with my wife and my family and the things that I have are the most important possessions, and I bear it to you in Jesus' name. Amen.